Hey, how's it going everybody? It's Tactor Ted. It is Friday the 30th of December 2022. Hope everyone's having a pleasant week. Yes, I've got my life a little more together right now and I'm able to start doing updates again. Um, interestingly enough, I know that I'm the master of I told you so, but apparently the Russians who have been running out of missiles launched their largest single day expenditure of missiles yesterday. Yes, absolutely. They put more missiles in the air over Ukraine than they have uh, the entire any other day since the operation started back in February. So what does this mean? Well, it means number one, our intelligence people are either lying or they have no clue what the fuck they're doing. I uh, I don't know which is worse, is if they're incompetent or if they feel they can um, intentionally mislead us. I, I do believe that's an issue. I do believe that's a severe issue. And I think everybody needs to be asking that before we go putting another eh, 30, 40 billion dollars in Zelensky's pocket. Now, the interesting thing is Nobody is talking about the damage. There are little individual reports, and of course, the Ukrainians, if they, you know, if the Russians sent 130 missiles, the Ukrainians shot 141 down. Um, you know, this is the typical way, and the Ukrainians don't like to uh, talk about what goes on as far as the missile strikes. They don't want to admit why. Well, it's perfectly honest, and I, I have no problem with this. They don't want to give the Russians any intelligence. They don't want the Russians to know how effective their strikes are. Um, and that's a lot of why they hide the information on the strikes. That's why they don't talk a lot. But if you go and you follow um, certain cities on Telegram or certain people on Telegram, uh, you come out with information uh, such as both thermal uh, power, two of the thermal power plants in and around uh, Kiev have hit. Uh, one burned for 20 some hours. The other one, I think it took them a little less time. I think it took them 14 hours to get that flat fire under control. So they are hitting uh, a lot of infrastructure. And one commentator who I follow, um, made a very, very valid point. The way that he judges how effective the Russian military strikes are has a lot to do with internet. Internet chatter, internet activity. There has, yesterday was the biggest net loss of internet connectivity since the war started. Um, and you can see on a lot of uh, the social media that I follow, a lot of that, a lot of the uh, Ukrainian channels aren't even working. Uh, and there are a lot of less posting. Um, so I think that speaks to exactly how much was done. Now, there's all sorts of new rumors out there. Uh, there's a rumor now that since uh, Russia had managed to capture a couple of the Starlink terminals, that they are have found a way that they can connect connect that they can detect um, Starlink terminals and put fire on them and uh, you know have no way to confirm whether or not this is true if it is it is going to be a big boost for disconnecting uh, the Ukrainian military from the internet because every time they boot up Starlink every time they have the re reception terminal active uh, it'll be able to be detected and put fire on if it is true and I, I'll caveat that because uh, there are a lot of things we get seen and we get told um, I'll give you a good example uh, people talk about it and it was big on uh, uh, social media uh, a couple months ago these mysterious lights shining into the sky from different points all over Russia uh, one beam of light came near uh, Omsk the city which I like to visit and I'm fairly familiar with. Um, and 
the scuttlebutt going around the internet then was it was a way to blind U.S. intelligence satellites. It was some sort of a satellite deterrent, satellite uh, weapon. And since we've heard nothing about it, nor do we hear the United States government bitching about their uh, satellites being taken out or interrupted with. Um, of course, they may be playing the same game the Ukrainians are. We're not going to talk about it. But I, I do believe that if the Russians did have something that would incapacitate American satellites, we'd heard about it. So this is why I'm mentioning this, is it could possibly be in the same vein uh, as this supposed uh, ability to detect and blow up uh, Starlink terminals. So only only time will tell. Um, there have been gains in and around Bakhmut. Um, there have been surprise gains of territory. Uh, don't know whether this was the fact that uh, troops had just had enough shelling and pulled out. I've heard uh, speculation from a couple of military pundits that it was new Ukrainian forces who were just put in. They got their first taste of a Russian artillery barrage and they said, fuck it, I'm going home. Um, and let's talk a little bit about artillery for a moment. Let's talk a little bit about artillery. Um, there is no other branch of the military that I have more respect for than the artillery. And it's not, I wouldn't say it's it's skill that I admire by the artillery guys, although it does take a lot of mathematical, or at least back in the day, it took a lot of mathematical knowledge to be able to calculate and, and fire and get the fire on target. Now that is, there's a little less because it's, it's more computerized and more GPS driven. But artillery, can come out of nowhere. It doesn't matter how skilled of a hardcore troop you are. It doesn't matter how proficient you are with your weapon, how proficient you are with land navigation, how well you can drive your tank. Artillery can fall on you in a moment's notice and you're done. And it doesn't even have to be on purpose. They can just decide to send a shell to who it may concern and it falls on your ass and you're done. And artillery is no joke. In fact, I'm sure I've related this before, but I'll relate it again. Um, during the Cold War, we were extremely concerned about how long we broadcast on the radio net. And a lot of the reason we were worried about that, because the Soviets were supposedly very, very good at radio detection. And if they could triangulate a signal, they could, based upon their activities in World War II and their massed artillery firepower that we knew that they possessed, uh, it was always told us, you know, the Russians can take out a grid square. Now, for those of you who are civilians, let's just say they could take out 1,000 meters by 1,000 meters. So think about, all, uh, I'll dumb it down, 1,000 yards. Let's just go the simplest. 1,000 yard by 1,000 yard area. And they could just mass firepower and that everything in there dies. Okay. So we had a lot of respect for that because, well, you nobody wants to get bloated up by artillery. So back in the day, we practiced not transmitting more than two to three seconds. Very, very brief, very direct, very to the point. Um, and we'd use break, break. You stop in the middle of a transmission, let off the key to stop transmitting. Now I always wondered, if you immediately, because we'd go one, two, and then back on. I always wondered if you keep getting, how is Soviet radio detection going to be getting better at you? Now, the Soviet Army is not the Russian Federation Army. The Russian Federation Army is much more advanced, much more put together. But if we had these kind of fears about what Soviet artillery and Soviet radio detection equipment was capable of, can you imagine how? 40 years later, we're dealing with all this new advanced equipment. In fact, uh, it's came out, and it's uh, no surprise that a lot of uh, Russian targeting has been done via Ukrainian cell phone traffic. Basically, when the guys go to turn on their phones and send a text home, my mom's still alive, next thing you know, Rounds start rolling into the area, and uh, you know, 
let's put it this way. Even if it doesn't kill the operator, being subjected to daily artillery and repetitive artillery. We had shell shock in World War I. Um, the amount of rounds we're seeing delivered and delivered onto target are comparable to World War I. Now, not everybody in World War I got shell shocked. Not everybody in this Ukrainian conflict right now is going to be shell shocked. But it can and will have a very profound effect upon you to be constantly shelled, to live under that constant fear. And artillery right now is a lot more accurate than it was. We can even take dumb artillery and make it more accurate by use of drones. And the Russians and the Ukrainians are making extensive use of drones. Um, and the Russians have gained the upper hand. You know, very early on in the war, much ado was made about the uh, the Ukrainian use of the Barakhtar drones that they were buying from Turkey. Now, I mean, the Lancets and all these suicide drones and all this, those are fine and dandy, but people are taking cheap drones, attaching grenades to them and a camera, overflying their enemy's positions and dropping grenades in. Now, that's pretty pinpoint. In fact, there was a video that surfaced not long ago. Uh, a Russian drone found a Ukrainian bunker. They found a ventilation pipe and they dropped a grenade straight down the ventilation pipe into the bunker, thus probably killing, asphyxiating, or burying anyone who happened to be occupying that bunker. Not a happy uh, result for any of the infantrymen, the poor grunts, who were occupying that position. And the weather, you know, everybody says that the Russians use the weather as a, as a, as a weapon. No. The weather is the Russian ally. It's not a weapon. But the Russians know well enough that a lot of the forested areas where the Ukrainian army have been digging in and putting in fortifications and been hiding are now defoliated because fall and winter. There are no leaves on the trees. If you've ever flew, and maybe some of you have, maybe some of you haven't, if you've ever flew over a forest in summer, you can't see the ground or jungle. You fly over a forest in winter, and it's a lot easier to see what's going on at ground level. And a lot of these drones are able to do that. And they're able to call in the artillery using the drones to correct. And this stuff is pretty deadly. And we're watching the evolution of warfare. Now, if, if you're an old grunt like, like I am, or even older, you remember the days of air power, how air power was everywhere. Air power, air power. Well, air power seems to have been taken a back seat, a back seat to, to drones, a back seat to missiles. And apparently the Russians are worried about Ukrainian air defense. Um, this may be a reason why they haven't put in their strategic bombers. This is possibly why we're not seeing uh, a ton more fighters being deployed. Um, although, the Russians have air superiority, they don't have air supremacy because of the air defense systems. And the air defense systems that uh, the Ukrainians are using, uh, the S-300s, are not the top of the line as far as the Russians go. And uh, it'll be interesting to see if and when that Patriot battery gets deployed, how well the Patriot does. Because not just Russian analysts, but I've heard lots of Western analysts doubt the Patriot system and reliability and flexibility as being anything comparable to the S-300, which the Ukrainians have lost in record numbers. And Putin, you know, for all of his bravado, has basically said this week that, man, eh, fine, deploy the Patriots, we'll, we'll destroy them. It'll be on the, on the ground. And now, speaking of Patriot, Patriot, we're going to switch gears and talk about a different kind of Patriot. So, for those of you who are familiar with the fighting going on in uh, Bakhmut and a lot of the fighting that's been going on in Ukraine, a um, private military contractor company called Wagner has been operating, and they're owned by a guy named Prigozhin, not, not to be confused with uh, Sergei uh, Rigozin or Dmitry Rigozin, excuse me, who used to run Roscosmos and who's now 
in Ukraine was just recently wounded. Um, in fact, he posted from the hospital that he's getting better. Uh, but Prigozhin, Prigozhin is the guy who runs PMC Wagner. Um, you may have seen the video that was posted where he went to a prison and he said, hey, you guys want out of prison, we'll let you out of prison. You're gonna serve with us six months, you'll get your rights back. But if you go AWOL or mess up, you're, you're, you're done, you're done. They won't find your body. Um, so this is Wagner, and of course we know the West, Western guys, they had their so-called counter Mozart, which I thought was a little artsy-fartsy. Uh, in fact, the Mozart guys, you know, came out this last week and admitted that Ukrainians are capping prisoners and doing all sorts of shit that used to get us thrown out of theater for supporting other governments, but somehow Ukraine doesn't have to follow uh, the law of the land warfare. But there's a new organization called PMC Patriot, or Patriot in uh, English, uh, and they're operating uh, south of uh, Zaporozhia. And there seems to be a lot of stuff going on um, down south and up north. Little movements, this, that, and the other that aren't getting the press. But then again, the press hasn't been being very honest or forthcoming about a lot that's going on. So the fact that they're employing a new uh, private military contractor group, um, you're starting to wonder how many of these groups... Um, are going to be able to operate with the Russian Federation and the makeup and everything. This is something new. This has recently been reported just this week, and I'm still looking into trying to find out information of who these guys are because it's still kind of uh, sketchy. Uh, it'll be interesting to see if they have their own Pergozin, a uh, guy who's a little larger than life and twice as uh, mouthy. Uh, not that I don't appreciate that. Um, and just see what these guys are all about. Um, so anyhow, folks, that's pretty much what I've got for for today. Uh, just a random, uh, random uh, smattering of nonsense. Uh, the first thing right off the bat was that we uh, are confirming that no, the Russians haven't run out of cruise missiles. No, the Russians haven't ran out of A, B, or C. And uh, the situation in Bakhmut continues to get worse. Um, they now have a foothold in the southwestern suburbs. Uh, they already had a, uh, a foothold in the uh, northern nor, uh, northwestern part, uh, or excuse me, northeastern part. It's the southwestern, but northeastern they had a, a foothold. And uh, the city is quickly under operational encirclement. In other words, it won't be too much longer than they'll be able to control the supply lines. And then the Russians are going to have to decide whether they're going to cut those supply lines off or whether they're going to allow the Ukrainians to continue to uh, feed uh, feed supplies and troops into that area to be you know, basically taken out and reduced by Russian troops. I think one of the big problems that a lot of folks in the West make is they see this as some sort of a land grab. And... Uh, you know, they're, they're worried about maps. They're worried about maps, this map, that map, the other map, this map, what's going on, what's being said. And that's not the case. This is a war of attrition. This is purely a war of mathematics when it comes to the Ukrainian army. They are interested in reducing their combat capacity and their numbers. And that's what's happening. They are destroying their equipment and killing their troops. That is what the Russian game plan is. Denazification, demilitarization, and then in the end, and number three, and it's always been number three, the liberation and security of Donbass. And I'm sure that you can add on now, because of the referendums, you can add on Zaporozhia and uh, Kherson region. But at the end of this, I'm hoping that enough people wise up that we have a serious conversation. A serious conversation about our intelligence community, about our military leadership, and about where both political parties in this country are trying to take us. Because Republicans, you, you guys can claim to be sir, uh, conservative minded. Uh, conservatives believe in war primarily as a last resort, not as a means to get whatever petty nonsense you want. And the idea of proxy wars 
that's the sort of skullduggery of empire. And we were not created out of empire. We were cr created in a response to empire, to empire being out of control, to empire controlling people on the other side of the world that don't have that much in common. I mean, we, we shared a uh, common language with the English and common beliefs, but we were making a life for ourselves and we didn't want to be strapped to the British Empire. And now we have become an empire. We have a permanent presence in Europe. Why do we have a permanent presence in Europe? Does any part of this country touch Europe? We don't. We don't touch Europe. Why are we constantly involved in Europe? World War I, when it was over, you, you can say anything you want to about American leadership at the time. But we said enough is enough. We pulled our folks home. Uh, we did a little bit of adventurism in uh, Russia. And uh, that didn't turn out so well. If you, if you study the, uh, the, Sub the Siberian uh, expedition that the U.S. troops did, it didn't turn out so well for us. And we decided that we had enough and we pulled everybody home. At the end of World War II, we didn't do that. In fact, we had an alliance and the alliance fractured after Germany was defeated. And after, um, well, even especially after the defeat of Japan, uh, the so-called alliance went to shit. And we started spying and conspiring against our former allies, and our former allies started, you know, conspiring against us. I'm not going to say that we were totally to blame. I don't think Stalin was a good guy in any way, shape, or form. Um, he was probably the leader that the Soviets needed to get them through World War II. Um, but he was he was a dictator. But there goes that hypocrisy again. He was our dictator, as opposed to. Uh, Adolf Hitler, who was the enemy dictator. But we need to be asking ourselves where we're going. Where are we ending up with this? What do we want for this country? And I'm, I'll am i be the first to tell you, I'm not a huge proponent of handouts, social programs. But I will be honest with you, I would have much rather gave $100 billion for the enrichment of the American people than I would for to give a hundred billion for the enrichment of Ukrainian oligarchs or as a kickback to the political parties <laughs> in the United States. Anyhow, folks, I've rambled on way too long. I'm at least two minutes over where I want to be. So, anyhow, I'll talk to you guys maybe tomorrow, maybe in the